if you go down Route 48 over the Mossside Bridge and turn right, you'll see what is called the Intermodal Terminal. But that terminal is only a small portion of what used to be there. There are grassy patches of land with abandoned railroad tracks, concrete pads where once stood sheds and workshops. Now it's all overgrown with weeds and a few scraggly locust trees. It's pretty quiet there now. But there was a time when they say you could actually feel a trembling under your feet, the very earth shaking to the thundering roar of massive locomotives rumbling through the night. The air pierced with the screech of high-pitched whistles, the clanging of bells, and the shuddering squeal of air brakes. It was the time of the railroads. And on that very spot stood the largest railroad marshalling yards east of the Mississippi, the Pitcairn Yards. The story begins in 1835 when a tobacco farmer named John McGinnis bought a piece of land just to the east of Pittsburgh. He began selling off lots at the place he called McGinnisville. At first, only a handful of farmers settled around McGinnis's property, and the place might have remained nothing more than a backwater were it not for what happened in 1850. By that time, the railroads were transforming American life, and the Pennsylvania Railroad was about to begin its east-west service across the state from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. And so it was that in 1850, the railroad bought a narrow right-of-way from John McGinnis. It established a station in that area called the Wall Station and began regular runs. These were the years of the railroads, and by the time of the Civil War, railroads on both sides were playing a vital role in the war effort. It was a war that touched everyone's life. Patton Township, with only a few hundred families, found some 60 soldiers who would fight in the war, most of them in the 63rd Pennsylvania Volunteers under Colonel Alexander Hayes. Of those 60s, some 30 are buried in our Crossroads Cemetery. Stephen Crane takes up the story of that terrible war. A firing began somewhere on the regimental line and ripped along in both directions. The sheets of flame developed great clouds of smoke that tumbled and tossed in the wind near the ground for a moment then rolled through the ranks as through a gate. The clouds were tinged with an unearthly glow in the sun, and in the shadows they were a sorry blue. The flag was sometimes eaten and lost in this mass of vapor, but more often it projected, sun-touched and resplendent. Pittsburgh, the Iron City, would become the arsenal for the Union, producing ammunition and the heavy cannons for the war. Cannon barrels cast at the Fort Pitt foundry had to be tested, and rural Patton Township was the perfect site for test firings. The wall proving grounds were established on the banks of the Turtle Creek just east of the Moss Side Bridge. This location was ideal as it was already on the railroad's right-of-way. Cannons could be hauled from Pittsburgh to the proving grounds by train, then tested by firing into the hillside across the creek. Larger guns could even be fired directly from railroad flat cars. Soon the growing railroad was running out of room at its facilities in downtown Pittsburgh. The city yards at 28th Street were too small to accommodate the large number of trains. And so in 1874, Robert Pitcairn, Divisional Superintendent of Pittsburgh Operations, began looking for a place to relocate the Pittsburgh yards. 
found a relatively flat expanse of valley floor in the Turtle Creek Valley, just east of Pittsburgh. The rail yards were then relocated and began to grow. The first receiving and classification yards were completed by 1892. By 1905, the westbound hump yard in Pitcairn was open. Here, rail cars were pushed up a hill, a hump, uncoupled, and then allowed to roll downhill into a remotely controlled sorting track. A series of four tracks ran up to each hump and fanned out into 35 in the receiving yards. Thus began the Decades Law Affair between Patton Township and the Pennsylvania Railroad. For many years, all east and westbound freight of the Pittsburgh Division of the PRR was channeled through the Pitcairn yards, and the yard grew into one of the largest classification yards on the PRR system. A newspaper reporter named Bruce Kish continues the story. Mr. Pitcairn carries eastward toward the Turtle Creek Valley, where lay the farmlands of the McGinnis, Britton, Wall, and Toohill families. In 1874, he purchased 215 acres of this land, about 15 miles from Pittsburgh. The track would serve as the new home for the Pittsburgh Rail Yard and for its workers. And for the next 20 years, the neighboring hillsides resounded with a thud of axes and a pounding of hammers as the forest yielded to a growing company town. In 1894, the village was incorporated as a borough, adopting the name of that railroad superintendent, Pitcairn. Soon the quiet streets of Pitcairn were ringing with a clanging of bells, the scream of shrieking whistles of mighty steam engines, and the haunting call of the low diesel's whine. Puffs of steam rose in great clouds from mighty locomotives that chugged and roared like mindless jungle beasts, going about their daily business in the massive switching yards. It was the age of steam, and the Pennsylvania Railroad reigned supreme. The Pitcairn Yard was its prized jewel. Don Waite, a retired railroad engineer, recalled that era. When the land between the Pitcairn and Wall rocked to the sounds of steam locomotives, screaming whistles, and rivet guns, guns that could have been a chorus of Gatling guns for all the racket they made, day and night, night and day, 24 hours a day. We had some people come here to stay from Philadelphia, and they said, how do you sleep with all that noise? And we said, what noise? It was just like music. You got used to it. Those were the days that had no beginning and no ending, at least not ones defined by the sun, when the yard was roaring with activity. When I was a youngster, I'd go down to ride the trains. Every Saturday, I'd go to Pittsburgh. It was exciting. The big steam monsters would be hissing. There was dirt all over the place. The sights and sounds were something you never forgot. In their heyday, the yards bustled with activity. Bruce Kish continues the story. From the west, trains pulled into the loading docks from Chicago and St. Louis and Cincinnati to drop off grain and agricultural products. Loading crews refilled the cars with manufactured goods and sent the trains back to the Midwest. Gray plumes of smoke rose into the sky. The air reverberated with the hum and whirl of machines and the pounding of sledges. Pitkin handled virtually every aspect of train travel and of maintenance. In the vast network of machine shops and factories were roundhouses used for repairing passenger and freight cars. Jobs were created daily. Don Fales, a local historian, talked about the newcomers who came to follow the railroad. Pitcairn started to grow a little bit more 
and more as more and more people came in. Who were these people? Where were they coming from? First of all, they were the ones who ran the trains, the rolling stock people, the engineers and firemen, the conductors and brakemen. A lot of those people came from Homewood Brushton area, Hayes and other parts of Pittsburgh. Some of them came from 28th Street. They came here with their families. They came here for the jobs. They needed houses. The houses were quickly built on 2nd Street, 3rd Street, 4th and 5th Street and on up the hill. Houses were built in the late 1800s and early 1900s and so on. But there still wasn't enough labor. They needed more people to come. They needed stone maces. They needed mechanics. They needed machinists. They needed track layers. They needed maintenance personnel. They needed clerks and all sorts and kinds of people to work. And the immediate area wasn't enough. So they sent delegations to the center part of the state and they recruited and brought them here. Farmers, for the most part, who would be trained for this new kind of work. They also went overseas. They sent delegations to Germany looking for trained mechanics and machinists. They recruited them to come to the Pennsylvania Railroad. They also went to Italy and there they recruited stonemasons, men who had been building things out of stone for centuries and doing great jobs of it. And they needed that done. And if you looked upon the bridges and the overpasses and the water routes along the railroad, they're made of stone. They needed the stonemasons that knew what they were doing and they got them. And then they needed the people for the labor and the laying of the tracks, basic labor, and they brought them over. In time, the Scots-Irish settlers were joined by these Germans and Italians and by immigrants from many countries around the world, all lured by good paying jobs for them and their families. Paul Kugert of the Gateway Newspapers gives a picture of the beehive of activity that was in the yard. The plants, brick smokestacks, the highest point in the yard loomed over everything. The stack thrust hundreds of feet into the air and spewed gray black smoke almost continuously. There were two roundhouses on the Pitcairn side of the valley, freight and passenger cars were repaired in a roundhouse that resembled a giant donut. The other roundhouse on the wall side was used for repairing locomotives. Like most of the yard's buildings, it was a busy place. During one 24-hour period, 200 engines were serviced and repaired at that yard. There was also a chain of shops, carpentry shops, metal shops, paint shops, where cars were built inside and out. Private cars were privately crafted and lavishly decorated in that Victorian age. It was there, during the yard's heyday between World Wars I and II, that workers turned out some 55 cars a day. They built boxcars and gondolas, flat, open-topped cars, usually used to carry lumber and machinery, and hoppers, also open-topped cars that were used to haul materials such as coal. The sides of a hopper were higher than a gondola's, and there is an opening at the bottom to empty the material. During World War II, more than 200 trains passed through each day. At one point, about 7,000 people from all over the valley were earning their paychecks at the railroad yards. These were the boom years. Ed Wingard, a retired railroad engineer living in Monroeville, remembered. The working conditions were such that today's railmen wouldn't put up with them. In the days of the steam engine, we had to wear coveralls, a bandana around our neck, and goggles to keep the cinders from irritating our eyes. Because we were assigned to duty for a maximum of 16 hours, 
we were required to rest eight hours between runs. We slept in the one-room bunkhouses in various locations along the track. As a fireman on a steam engine for two years, I shoveled coal and operated a stoker. It was hot and dirty work, but I was learning skills. The difference between steam and diesel engines was significant. Running a diesel engine was easier because maintaining the right speed with the right engine was challenging. Of course, the diesel was cleaner, and it changed our way of dressing. Instead of coveralls, we could wear casual clothes. But I feel the diesels took the romance out of my engineer's job. I like being a steam locomotive engineer. Over the years, I hauled a variety of freight, including produce, cattle meat, manufactured goods and various ores. Later, my train cars also hauled automotives and trucks. I always liked my job. It was challenging, well-paying, and encouraged a special fellowship among the railroad men. Years later, when only the ghost of the old yard remained, longtime railroader David Cutchell told of that fellowship. Mondays and Tuesdays were usually quiet, then a number of freight and passenger trains gradually picks up on Wednesday and Thursday, and by Friday they're hammering through the town. Whenever I hear those trains I think back to the old days when Pitcairn was a railroad town. And it was a company town. Many a son followed in his father's footsteps working in a machine shop, roundhouse, or the offices. In my family, my grandfather was a conductor, and his father and brothers were engineers, and his uncle an air brake foreman in the steel shop. I worked as a clerk in the yards for most of my career, as did my sister. Penzi employees were a close-knit family. If you went to the bank and said you worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad, you never had a problem getting a loan. I was proud to be a railroader. Arthur Fox, a longtime Pitcairn resident, well remembered growing up in a railroad family. Raised in a railroad family, I lived half a mile from the continuous turbulence and the clamor and the thick gray haze generated by one of the largest rail facilities in the world, Pennsylvania's Pitcairn Yards. In the 1950s, my weekends were filled with playing in the dusty abandoned buildings and oil-soaked wooden sheds bordering the PRR tracks, exploring box cars on remote sidings, and laying pennies along the rails to watch them flatten into thin copper wafers by the passing trains. Cairn workers kept the trains running. A spirit and enthusiasm and pride united the 7,000 men of all races and nationalities who worked in the Pitcairn yards during the 40s. That spirit appeared to be forged by tough hiring practices. Family connections became a prerequisite for employment on many crews. Fathers worked alongside their sons. The family connections also made the workplace a happier group of individuals. The camaraderie was reflected in the daily life of Pitcairn families. For instance, my father, grandfather, and two uncles all worked for the railroad. My grandmother kept the kitchen table permanently set for meals since railroaders worked unconventional schedules in those days. When I was in high school, I worked as a clerk in Peter Sierra's cramped corner confectionery store that was just across the Iron Railroad Bridge from the railroad station to Broadway. Pete's served as a cross-section of the borough when railroaders, rail passengers, and locals crowded the store in late afternoons and evenings.
During the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, I provided passengers fresh off the trains with updates from our small radio. Pete's not only provided services, but functioned as the town's social club. Many of the businesses along Broadway, facing the railroad across the Turtle Creek, provided for the needs of railroaders and thrived until the late 1960s. Another of the local businesses along Pitcairn's Broadway that grew up to cater to the railroad workers was Amelia Shipley's tiny luncheonette next to the Broadway Hotel. The town was so crowded with workers, railroad crews, passengers, and soldiers who were coming and going, you couldn't walk on the streets for eight hours a day. Every eight hours, a railroad crew would stop in for a shift. They came from Altoona, and Nola, and Columbus. And after they ate at the restaurant, they went to the Broadway or one of the boarding rooms to get some sleep. They paid a 10 cent deposit on the room and the company picked up the tab. And when it was time for them to go, two calling boys covering the shift would leave their rooms at the Y and knock on the doors. The railroaders were my friends. After you serve those guys for 20, 25 years and see them every other day, they became part of the family. Well, that all ended after World War II as one by one, yard operations were phased out or relocated. By 1960, employment at the Pitcairn Yards had fallen to almost a thousand. And in 1967, Pennsylvania Railroad ceased all major operations at the Pitcairn Yards. By 1979, only five workers remained. In the end, Conrail, successor to the PRR, decided it could no longer afford to keep the Pitcairn Yards open. It was a bitter decision. Workers with years of loyal service lost their jobs. Local businesses suffered, but some, like Mrs. Shipley's luncheonette, managed to hang on for a while. Still, the atmosphere around town wasn't the same. The abandoned yard was to experience a rebirth in 1996, given a new leash on life as an intermodal facility operated by Conrail and then by the Northern Southern Railroad. And so, how do we wrap up this story? How do you tell the story of a town? Well, you might choose a single thread from the tapestry of life that makes up that community. And what we've done is charted the glory days of the Pitcairn, the railroad town, and met some of the folks who have been along for the ride. But towns change, and so it is with Pitcairn. Beginning in the years after World War II, the Pennsylvania Railroad began its gradual withdrawal. By the 1980s, only a ghost of the sprawling yards remained. Tracks now occupied by the Conrail Intermodal Terminal, which kept the pulse of the railroad alive, transferring freight from trucks to trains. And so we've come back to the old yards, the place where it all began so many years ago. And throughout its history, Pitcairn, like so many of the industrial towns along our rivers, has built its own unique small town character. The people of Pitcairn have readily volunteered to serve in various religious, fraternal, and social organizations, all dedicated to helping their neighbors. Youth organizations, sports teams, various unions, and church groups have all come forward to help. It's their efforts that form the ongoing character of the community of Pitcairn. 